Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Healthy Travelers Summit, where we have been joined by so many amazing health practitioners, people who are sharing their best information of their entire careers with each and every one of you. And we're very excited about our speaker today, Dr. Nalini Chilkoff. But before that, if this happens to be your first call that you're joining us, uh, my name is Robin Benson. I'm a doctor of oriental medicine in Santa Fe, Mexico. I've been practicing for the last 23 years, and I also am the founder of Santa Fe Soul Center for Optimal Health. I also happen to be a world traveler. I've been to over 70 countries, and this is part of my passion for this whole summit. But also, I treat so many patients um, on a regular basis who travel traveled for their work, they travel for pleasure, and they end up with aches and pains, they're having sleep difficulties, hormone issues, and that's why we're bringing these voices together to help you travel wise, to help you travel healthy every day. So I want to say... Dr. Nalini, are you here right now? I am. Can you see me? I can see your beautiful face. All right. We're good. Okay. We're good. We're loving technology. (laughs) So so let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Nalini, who happens to be a dear friend of mine. Um, She is the founder of IntegrativeCancerAnswers.com and the author of the best-selling book, 32 Ways to Outsmart Cancer. How to Create a Body in Which Cancer Cannot Thrive. Dr. Chilkoff is not only a leading edge authority on integrative cancer care, immune enhancement, optimal nutrition, and wellness medicine, but she is also a, she is also a lifelong world adventure traveler. Dr. Nalini has traveled to the High Himalayas, to equatorial, the equator, equatorial, Tropical islands. Oh my goodness! Help me out. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> and jungles and bush walked through Africa and South America. She has decades of stories to share and secrets for staying healthy in the most remote and extreme environments. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for that help with that word. Equa. Equatorial. Thank you, equatorial. <laughs> And I love, I love the title of your talk, Adventure Travel Tales, Dr. Nolini's Keys to Staying Healthy No Matter Where You Are. Yes. And I just wanted to say before we, we hear more from Dr. Nolini, we interviewed um, Dr. Chokoff for the, the Self-Care Revolution because of her, her latest book, which is amazing, by the way. And quite frankly, this is an issue for a lot of people who travel on a regular base, basis, pilots and flight attendants. Flight, flight attendants, yeah. and many other people. Um, in my research, I, I came across a lot of studies that have shown that people who travel at 30,000 feet on a regular basis, 30, 40 mm-hmm. hours mm-hmm. a week, are more prone to certain types of health challenges, including cancer. Yes. In fact, one of our speakers mentioned um, that pilots are more susceptible to lymphoma. There's studies. Yes. And so we're going to hear a lot from Dr. Nalini, not only about her adventure travels and what to do, but I'd love for you maybe to you know, start by sharing your history as a, as a doctor of oriental medicine, the reason you wrote your book, and maybe shed some light on some of the pearls of that book that, that relates okay. to our listeners. Sure. Well, I really got interested in cancer care when both of my parents had more than one episode of cancer each, and that's really where it started. And they were just both in their 50s at the time, so that's young to to have more than one episode of cancer. And I have to say they're both in their late 80s now, so they're still alive and well and cancer-free. But that that's what got me started. And then, of course, all of us now are surrounded by someone we love or know or close to us that has cancer because the the statistics are pretty staggering. One in two men, one in three women in the United States in their lifetime will have a cancer diagnosis. So we're, it's all around us now. And so, of course, it was in my clinic more as well. And I really wanted to create what I call a health model for cancer so that right from the moment of diagnosis, you actually have a plan for your health. And in the oncology setting, in the doctor's office, you're just in this war on cancer. And really, truly, patients and their families aren't interested in a war on cancer. They're just interested in being well and getting on with their lives and getting over cancer. 
So there has to be a plan for that. And that's not inside of conventional oncology. So I really made it my mission to really have a complete plan. So the way that I describe it is twofold. And this is a great way to think about it. One is if you think about a garden and you have to really build the soil and have good water and fresh air and all the nutrients that the plant needs to be really robust, resist disease and give you beautiful flowers and fruits, right? And so our cells need the same thing. That environment that your cells are in will either give rise to healthy cells or cancer cells. And so you have to really change the soil of your own inner terrain. And so that's really the, the ground of this is to create an environment around your cells where it's not possible for cancer to arise, to thrive, to grow, to develop, and to spread. And so that's really the big picture. And then my book, 32 Ways to Outsmart Cancer, are just these really practical, pragmatic steps that anybody can implement to get started. And the book's just divided up into what you can do with food and diet, what you can do with lifestyle and rest and stress management, and what the most important herbs and supplements are that you can take. And there's also a bunch of free recipes on my website because if you want to eat healthy and eat an anti-cancer diet, then you have to get started that way. And I was a chef, so I think, oh, that's so easy. But actually, we get the most clicks on our recipes. So um, the recipes are really good because I was a chef also. So there's lots of resources on integrativecanceranswers.com. Okay, great. So about the statistics I mentioned earlier. Yes. Tell me, so what are your thoughts on that? On, what can, well, uh, out before. Okay, go ahead. I, I don't have the statistics on pilots and stewardesses on the tip of my tongue, but I do know that the primary reasons why pilots and stewardess and also people who just travel a lot suffer more illness are a couple of big factors. One, the exposure to radiation at high altitudes is extreme. And so if you're going to be traveling a lot by air, then you really need to increase your antioxidant protection in order to prevent DNA damage, which is the damage to your genes that is the initiating factor for cancer. And so uh, it can be really simple to do that. Like I'll travel with a concentrated greens powder or reds powder that you can just put in your water. And that's a great way to get a lot of plant chemicals that are super antioxidants. You can also take a uh, an antioxidant capsule, but it's really simple to travel with these greens and reds powders just in a Ziploc bag and put it in your drinking water. And when you're on a plane, you get very dehydrated. And so it's very important to also be drinking quite a lot. And so uh, by having these powders, putting it in your water bottle, then that's a strategy. But the other reason why pilots and stewardess get a lot of illness, particularly uh, hormonal imbalances as well as immunologic imbalances is because of the crossing so many time zones. It's an incredible stress. We're on a 24 hour bio clock. And so when that gets disrupted, so do all of our regulatory systems in our body. And so uh, one of the simplest ways actually to deal with that is to make sure that you go outside in the sunlight with no lens in front of your eye in the new time zone and it helps reset that 24-hour bio clock and you're an acupuncturist you'll appreciate this also another method is to squeeze the tips of your toes and your fingers to uh, invigorate and stimulate all of your 12 energy meridians, that. right, right, you know, you just squeeze all, all of them, and in Japan, they actually have another tradition where they take an incense stick and light the end of it, and then tap the ends of the meridians, so we take, on the corner of each nail, you would just put the incense stick there, on all your, right. all your 10 toes and fingers, and it kind of resets your body clock, so those are are simple things anybody can do. It doesn't take a lot of technology, but it really helps to do that and to also start to eat your meals at the time that would be in your new time zone and try to exactly. get your sleep sort of up to your new time zone. But I'll tell you, I travel to India and Bhutan quite a lot, 
and it from where I live, it's 12 and a half hours different. So that you're just so upside down on your time zone. I always pray not to fall asleep in my lunch, you know, because we're still human and it takes a while to adapt. So that's a big stress on your adrenal glands. So a nice herb for that is rhodiola, which is also a great herb for high altitude and endurance. Like I do a lot of high altitude climbing. My highest pass was 18,000 feet up in the wow. Himalayas. And I always say that's my plan for preventing osteoporosis is high altitude climbing. So there's a lot of things that you can do to strengthen your own regulatory systems. So rhodiola is number is the first one you mentioned. Yes, yes. So well, now that we're talking about high altitude, let's just talk about that a bit. So there's a number of interesting things about being at high altitude. I really studied high altitude physiology because it's unique. One of the interesting things to know about that is that fitness is not the factor in whether or not you adapt well to high altitude. Once you have adapted, being fit, of course, is better if you're going to hike and climb. But it actually, there's genetic factors. So think about people who traditionally live at high altitudes like the people of the Andes or the people of the Himalayas. They have genetics that allows them to make more red blood cells, which are the cells that carry oxygen. So we have to, it takes us time. It takes about uh, every 2,000 feet, it takes a day to adapt, right? So if you're going up to 10,000 feet, it takes you five days to actually adapt to being there to feel normal, right? So that's I'm kind of Santa Fe, right? Where it's like yes, seven thousand yeah, feet, so it gets yeah, people a couple of days. Yeah. So I definitely treat a lot of people for altitude challenges. Yeah, but think yeah. about it. When you, if you were to fly into Timpu and Bhutan, you'd just be one thousand feet off. Whereas I come from sea level, right? So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I was just in Santa but Fe. They have the altitude. This is good. You're talking about that. Not only the the altitude difference, but also the time difference. That's a double yes, whammy. They're both. Yeah, it's really hard. So. So if you're going to do some high altitude traveling in a time zone far away from where you are, you have to give yourself some time. So when I go to Asia to climb the Himalayas, I give myself a week, I fly into Timpu or into Kathmandu and stay there for a week and then go up because it's so much less stressful. So here's my high altitude cocktail. Number one, you need more iron when you're at high altitude. So you want to take maybe 50 milligrams of iron every day. You also, interestingly enough, high altitude causes you to utilize more carbohydrates. So we always think about protein and fats for energy, but actually at high altitude, you have a higher need for carbohydrates. So it's important to have some grains or some root vegetables, something like that. Not, not, uh, uh, simple car- carbohydrates like sugars and fruits, but actually some fuel, right? So that's really important as well. And then I keep sublingual chewable B12 and also uh, chewable CoQ10 in my pocket. And I about every hour or two, I'll take about a thousand micrograms of methylcobalamin. Make sure you get the methyl form of B12 and also CoQ10. There's a couple companies that make nice chewable CoQ10, so you can just pop those in your mouth. And then I also make a little mixture of some of the adaptogenic herbs that dilate your blood vessels and also help with adaption to stress. So we mentioned rhodiola. Ginkgo is one of the best herbs for high altitude. And then I also put in Siberian ginseng. And then if I am in a cold place, then I'll also put in some ginger and cinnamon in there as well. And so that's sort of my really simple cocktail. And I'll actually blend it into a little bottle and I'll pour it into my drinking water and I'll just be drinking it the whole time I'm climbing. And I'll I'll tell you, I was just in Peru last year and I was up at about 12,000 feet and I was hiking with a young woman who was a yoga instructor who was 27 and then a man who was in his 40s. I'm in my 60s. I out hiked them both. They decided to rest and I kept going. I went all the way up to the sun gate at Machu Picchu and then beyond and they just waited for me at the bottom so. I'm impressed yeah so just to, to, to say this again so ginkgo Siberian ginseng ginger and cinnamon in your water rhodiola correct? and rhodiola 
and rhodiola, and then you do about 50 milligrams of iron. 50 milligrams of iron glycinate per day, okay. and 1,000 micrograms of chewable sublingual methylcobalamin B12 about every other hour if you need it. And you can also chew on about 100 milligrams of CoQ10 every other hour if you need that. And then I also keep some separate ginkgo tablets in 50 milligrams, and I'll also take those. And you can also take the ginkgo before you get to your high altitude as well. And that's a good, that's a good cocktail right there. So maybe talk about hydration too, what you yes. do. Yeah. So uh, when you're at high, high altitude, your need for fluids goes way up. And so the day before you expect to be at high altitude or even the day before you're going to be on a, you know, nine or 13 hour plane ride, you want to start hydrating, but you don't want to only replace water. You want to replace your electrolytes. And what does that mean? What does electrolytes mean? Uh, most people think it just means sodium and potassium, but it really means like a, a whole complement of minerals that are found in fruits and vegetables. So again, that's why I really like the greens powders and the reds powders, but you can also get these wonderful electrolyte replacement powders that are not full of chemicals. So you don't want to do Gatorade, right? You want to pick something that's chemical free and you can find these online. I actually found a very cool company that's for high altitude uh, bike trips and they make this little packet that has B vitamins, rhodiola, CoQ10, ginkgo, and a little bit of fructose for to keep your blood sugar up for uh, high altitude endurance sports like like biking, but you could certainly use it for climbing. So I got those and I took those packets and I put them in my drinking water. And, uh, you know, another thing that you really want to be mindful of on, on long plane rides is your exposure to inhaling everybody else's virus and bacteria as they sneeze and cough into their hands and then touch the same surface as you're touching. So one of my tricks for that, so hydration is really important. You want to keep your your the lining of your nostrils and your sinuses and your throat really moist so you want to drink 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 if you're not peeing every hour you're not really drinking enough so true. you know so and then if you do that on the plane then you're getting up and walking uh, about every hour to go pee and so that's great because one of the risks of long plane flights are blood clots and embolisms because you're just sitting there and your blood can clot in your legs and if that obstructs the blood vessels in your legs or if a little blood clot forms and that travels to your lungs that's actually life-threatening and so when you're on a long plane ride you want to get up and walk every hour anyway so if you drink enough you have to and if you actually uh, are older and you have any blood clotting issues or you have uh, atrial fibrillation or you're on anti and any clotting medications, it's even more important that you get up and walk and stay hydrated and keep your blood really watery and not thick, right? So, uh, Amy, what do you think about those socks? Oh, they're actually, they're great. So what you're asking about are compression stockings. So if you are going on a long, long plane ride, and especially if you're older or if you're overweight or if you have clotting issues or blood pressure issues, you want to get compression socks that go up to your knee. And they're just basically like thick stockings, basically, made of elastic that compress your legs a little bit so less fluid pools in your ankles and your feet and it helps the the blood flow go back up out of your feet but you should also just be sitting there and pumping your feet and and moving and not just staying in one position because one of the great risks of long long plane flights are blood clots and so that's really crucial and you know if you take a little bit of omega-3 fatty acids say you take 2,000 milligrams for about every four hours you're on the plane. That reduces your blood clotting, reduces inflammation. And so uh, ginkgo also has some uh, anti-clotting properties as well. 
You know, what I want to mention when you're talking about minerals, because I think this is so important, um, and I'm really super picky about how things taste. Yeah. I found something that I absolutely love, and really this this uh, Lisa Lent is part of this whole um, Healthy Child Summit, Oxalent. Yes, that's a it's, great product. It's a great I product. I love it, yeah. love it, love it. And yeah. I just want to tell you all, I mean, whether we're talking about high altitude, um, travel, or just traveling by plane, always carry that, because it's, it's, I'm, like I said, really picky. Airborne has got some junk in it yeah, that I don't yeah, really care yeah, about. Yeah. And even um, some of the other competitors, I, I don't think Era is good. And I know Lisa was, a, she herself was a flight attendant and had at right. age 28 yeah. had an right. embolism. And right. Right. so she created something that's just so yes. um, pure yeah. and yeah. has the antioxidants yeah. that you're mentioning. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to, since yeah. we're talking about minerals, I just yeah. want to say it's the Great best product. thing I've come across. Yeah. I just do it every day to stay healthy. It's part yeah. of my yeah, My it's a good product. Healthy every day. Yeah, I want to just um, remember to say also for long plane flights, I take a little bottle of colloidal silver solution with me traveling, and you can actually put that inside your nose and spray it inside your throat, or just uh, take a little bit and gargle with it, and that will act as a local antibiotic. So that if you're inhaling other people's viral particles or bacteria from them sneezing or coughing on the plane, then that really protects you a lot. And you can also use the colloidal silver solution to clean wounds. And so it's okay. a nice thing to have in your kit. Okay, good. Yeah. Colloidal silver. Is there a particular, I'm, 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 I'm totally okay if there's a brand that you like. Yes. So these people did not have to go searching. Yes. Um, because I, I'm not very all picky. colloidal silver is made equal. Just the same as not all mineral supplements exactly. are made, made so, equal. So I like Designs for Health makes a great product called Silver Cillin. And it comes okay. in a spray bottle. It also comes in a, a bigger bottle of liquid so you can refill your spray bottle. And um, But traveling spray bottles are a little dicey, so I always go to the mountaineering store and get the leak-proof bottles, and I put everything in those so nothing leaks in my suitcase. And um, the silver cylin made by Designs for Health is a particularly small particle, and that's what makes it actually more effective. You'll see a lot of uh, colloidal silver products on the market, but they're not all the same. And also, okay. they make a gel. They actually make a gel. And uh, you can also use that gel to coat wounds, to cover wounds. But just traveling, you want to take one thing, just take the liquid. Okay, good. So how do you prepare for your trips? Well, um, number one, you have to have, you have to be well rested. That's really important. It's kind of hard <laughs> when you're trying to get ready to go and pack and finish everything up that you need to do. But being well rested is important. And um, I, I can sleep anywhere. I can sleep in the middle of an airport. I can sleep on a plane. That's not true of anybody. If I'm tired, I just go to sleep. So um, I think it's partly because I'm a lifelong meditator. I can just sort of choose what state I want to be in. So I think it's really important to kind of get out of the framework where you think you can't sleep somewhere and just sort of psych yourself into relaxing, dropping down, going to sleep if you're tired, if you need to. Um, I think that uh, L-theanine is a nice, safe way to wind down some of the nervous uh, system neurotransmitters to relax and be able to go to sleep. Certainly, melatonin is very important because in normal sleep, as, the, as darkness comes, your brain starts to make melatonin, which starts to help you to feel sleepy and have a good night's rest. But the really cool thing about melatonin also is it's a super antioxidant. So if you're on a plane and you want to go to sleep, people take not enough melatonin. You can take up to 20 milligrams of melatonin safely. I usually recommend 10 milligrams because you get this super antioxidant protective effect, but then you also get a little bit sleepy from it and it, it gives you a chance to go to sleep you know? so what's the timing how do people this is always a tough one for people to yeah. understand when to take it on a plane knowing that they're going to get there you know 12 hours different than what their biology is used to well you have to again the real strategy for preparation is to try to get your body clock to be closer to wherever you're going so right you know if you're going uh three time zones away it's a little bit easier but i'll travel 12 time zones away and then that's really hard to do so you can just 
approximate, you know, go to bed a little bit earlier, eat your meals, think about, you know, is it breakfast time where I'm going and try to shift when you eat your meals. Um, but I found that's, that's sometimes not very practical, but it's ideal if you can do that. But the best thing to do is when you get to where you're going is go outside and let the sunlight hit your eyes because exactly. that's what that's what resets your pituitary gland, which is your 24-hour bio clock. And so the more that you do that, the sooner your body will, will move to the time zone where you are. And then, of course, acupuncture is fabulous or just the, you know, finger toes things we just mentioned. But those are the main things. And if you're well hydrated, it's also easier if you're eating uh, proper nutrition, it's easier. So, you know, you now you have to take your food on the plane. You know, there's nothing good to eat on a plane anymore. So you plan to take food with you on the plane. And yeah. I'll tell you a great strategy because I even do this uh, wherever I travel. I take a shaker bottle and I put my, my protein powder and my greens powder in the shaker bottle. And then I'll also put my herbs. So I'll put in ginkgo and I'll put in some milk thistle and I'll put in some of my brain nutrients I'll put in a little extra carnitine and then while you're on the plane you can just put water or juice in it shake it up and then you have this cool high protein super nutritious meal which where you're going to get that on a plane right that's great right so I take that and every single morning wherever I'm traveling I make myself a protein drink because one of the challenges traveling is actually getting enough protein to eat some places healthy clean protein and so that's what keeps your digestive tract uh, resistant to infection and keeps your muscle mass up it gives you endurance if you're doing something strenuous if you're kayaking or or hiking and uh, it's kind of an insurance policy that you'll actually get enough protein and that gives you good resistance to infections also I want to tell you I've done extreme adventure travel I have never once had dysentery never once and so part of that is washing your hands number one uh, but part and part of it is just looking around at who's cooking your food and serving and do they clean their dishes or not and if not, if you're going to a place where you're wondering about that, bring your own cup, bring your own plate, bring your own fork and knife and spoon, wash it yourself and tell them, serve my food to me on this. And that's what I do like when I go to a lot of remote areas. I have my own dishes and utensils. I wash them myself. I keep them clean and I ask for my food to be served on those. And that's one reason I don't get sick. That's really smart. Yeah. So about malaria, what do you do when you go to countries where they recommend you take the malaria pills? Okay, so the truth of the matter is that the best way to prevent malaria is to sleep under a mosquito net and to wear long sleeves at dawn and dusk. That is the absolute best way to prevent malaria. And um, another really cool thing that you can do, and I'll, I'll say something about malaria medication in a moment, but you can get these containers of pyrethrin, which is a solution made from grapefruit seeds. And it's a, it's a, a insecticide, pesticide repellent that is in grapefruit seeds. It's not toxic to us. And so I get a big container of it and I fill my bathtub with water. I pour in the pyrethrin and I soak my clothes that I'm going to wear hiking and outside and, and uh, in in camps and it stays in your clothes through a number of washings and it repels insects if you travel with a mosquito net you can soak your net in that also and that's one thing that you can do but absolutely the best way to avoid malaria is to not get bit by a mosquito that's carrying malaria so yeah. those mosquitoes are out at primarily at dusk and so you have to have Long sleeves with a tight seal at your wrist and also pants that have a little elastic that you can tie up or put a rubber band around your pant leg. Wear some socks even if you're in a hot place and have your collar tighten up like that. And, you know, that's the best way because one of my patients is one of the top malaria researchers in the world and almost all mosquitoes are resistant to all the medication. So... Wow. So there's that fact. Now, there's, I have to say a caveat, because there's different types of malaria. And there's one strain of malaria called falciparum. 
And that kind of malaria can put you in a coma in hours and it will kill you. So uh, you have to understand where you're going, what type of malaria is in the area where you're going. Are you going during rainy season? If you are, your risk is high because the uh, mosquitoes breed in puddles of water. And so if you're going in the dry season, you have almost no risk, you know, almost no risk. So the malaria medications are actually toxic to your nervous system, especially older people can have permanent brain damage and permanent nerve damage from malaria medication. I actually, my um, sister-in-law's father was permanently disabled by malaria medication. And so uh, you have to be very careful with it. So um, there aren't a lot of great alternatives. Artemisia is uh, uh, an extract. There's a medication called Arten Artesunate, and it is active actually against cancer as well as malaria, but it's hard to get it. Uh, but you can take malaria uh, formulas that are made with artemisias or take artemisin in. You can get that from like allergy research allergy. group. Yeah. Makes that. You know, I studied, when I was in Kenya, I spent some time with a medical doctor who was a specialist yeah. in malaria, and he was doing a ton of research on, on that, on yeah. this particular artemisinin, yeah. and really great results. Yeah. So when, I, when I've gone to a lot of these countries, I, I think I've only taken the malaria drugs once when I went to Haiti. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I've taken homeopathic versions. Yeah. I've, work, I've worked with another um, DOM uh, acupuncturist in Santa Fe actually and and just boosting my my immune system yes, and yes, I think it's yes. a big message for yes. everyone who's listening I think you've heard this from a lot of speakers just keeping the antioxidants that Dr. Malini's mentioning but keeping your body healthy on a regular basis yes. so you're going to these destinations with a much better immune system because the same mosquito can maybe bite 10 people yes. and not everyone's yes. going to get malaria so you want to be that person that is protected and I'm glad you mentioned grapeseed extract. Can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of antiparasitic and other uses for it? Uh, grapeseed extract is primarily an antioxidant, but it does have some uh, antiparasitic activity. Uh, I actually like to take little formulas that, uh, if we're going to talk about parasites and gut health, you know, you have to keep healthy bacteria in your gut to have resistance. So. Every traditional culture has fermented food. So you can definitely eat the fermented food that's in the culture where you are, for sure. And, you know, always take a good uh, temperature-stable acidophilus uh, product with me. And a lot of seeds have these antiparasitic properties. But, uh, you know, there are, are supplements that are made of walnut hulls and grapeseed extract and uh, artemisia and... Uh, garlic and these are all natural antimicrobial antiparasitics and so uh, I make it a, a practice to take some probiotics and one of these herbal capsules every single day and uh, to eat some fermented food wherever I am every single day so what does that mean so uh, that could be a fermented cabbage product which you'll find all different kinds of those all over Asia could be miso in Japan, it could be sauerkraut in Europe, could be um, kefir or some kind of a fermented milk product if you can do dairy. So these are incredibly protective. And uh, again, hydration is very important. And then, you know, this pragmatic stuff, you have to be eating mostly cooked food if you're in an area where it's doubtful. And then if I rent a house someplace, then I'll just soak my vegetables in fruits in an iodine solution. And pretty much any country where there's issues around parasites and food, all the grocery stores have solutions of iodine that you put in a sink with your vegetables and fruits and you soak them. And then it kills the parasites that are on the surface of your food. Then you could actually have a nice salad if you want. And what about, and also hydrogen peroxide is really good too. Hydrogen peroxide, I'm very careful with it, though, because it's actually a pro-oxidant if you take it orally. And if you take it too much, it can actually break down the lining of your gut. So if you're going to be on a long trip, you have to be careful with it. So you definitely want to 
dilute it. Yeah, but little I, tiny it's bits. It's a really yeah. great way yeah. to, to, even in America, we, we, we just talked to a, a D1 parasitologist right. about right. how important it is. Like one of the things to avoid if we travel just went anywhere is salad bars. Yes. Just stay away from yes. them because yes. cryptosporidium, yes. there's so many yes. parasites yes. in because they just don't, they don't have good practices in, in most restaurants. Okay. You know, right. So I'm glad you're, you're talking about That's this. Right. That's right. You know, High end hotels pretty much all do it. They all now now in larger areas they'll filter the water, they'll soak the vegetables. But you have to ask, you know, you really have to ask. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Cool. And, you know, you can travel with your own uh water filter, but it's a lot of work to pump the water through it. It's kind of slow and you really need to drink more water than you can make yourself in a day typically. So uh, it's it's okay uh, in, in a pinch, but most places you can boil your water or get bottled water that's clean water. So uh, even in village areas today, people are pretty hip to the fact that water has to be boiled. You know, so. Exactly. So did you study in China? I didn't. No, no I, I actually went to China. Was like when yeah. I was twenty seven, a long yeah, time ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, but talking about food, you know, the food, the Chinese food was so bad there that I ended up right. living on carbohydrates, and all the fermented food looked so yeah. scary. I didn't really yeah. know the value yeah. of it yeah. twenty years ago. Yeah. So I ended up gaining weight. I was a runner too. Yeah. I mean, I would. Yeah. But I was. I, there's just a few things that I could even tolerate yeah. but now I've, I'm a much smarter healthier yeah. travel yeah. traveler yeah. so I will bring you know some of some really good canned foods that are yes. in the BPA yes. Yes. Can, yes. Like, like sardines like yes. our, our good friend Randy Hartnell yes. I love Vital Choice yes. so so these are the things for you for people to think about I mean I know your suitcase and mine I mean <laughs> anybody that, that, that's a travel expert any of our speakers we know to take food yes we yes. some some, yeah. some of, of our colleagues right they have a whole se that's separate right. suitcase that's just right. devoted to that's Right. That's and right. this can be you too so just know there yeah. are solutions yeah. out yeah. there so there I'm glad are. we're there discussing are. food the other thing I really want to mention that I think it's important to be mindful about is wound care especially if you're in the tropics because mm -hmm. if you have a cut you have to keep it clean and covered you must keep it covered because insects will lay eggs in an open wound in the tropics and a lot of people don't know that. And so you absolutely, if you get any kind of a scrape or a cut or anything, immediately you clean it and immediately you cover it and you keep it clean and you keep it dry. It's just crucial because not only will insects come and be attracted to any of your secretions or blood or serous fluid, They'll lay eggs in your wound and also malaria mosquitoes will be attracted to one drop of blood on your skin. A mosquito will find it. And so you, it's really important to have good wound care. So you want to have a kit that allows you to clean a wound well and also to keep it covered and dry. And so uh, most uh, mountaineering stores have these great uh, bandages that really seal off like their second skin so they breathe but they actually seal off so that you can't get sand or grit in there and I'll give you another tip too let's say you're hiking and you fall and you scrape yourself and there's a bunch of stuff in your wound and you're not around water you can take a plastic bag and you can put water in it and then punch a little hole and then squeeze it and you get enough water pressure to clean the wound. You can do that if you get something in your eye also from your clean drinking water, right? And uh, then you can put the silver psyllin uh, solution in there and then cover it and make sure you keep it clean and dry. And remember, if you have an open wound and you're bathing, you may be bathing in water that actually has bacteria in it. And so you have to clean that wound again and cover it again after you bathe. Awesome. Yeah. These are great, yeah. great yeah. tips. Yeah. So this is a tropical type of travel. Any, Absolutely. any more tips on, Absolutely. on traveling in the tropics? Well, actually, I'll tell you the two things I always make sure I have in my kit are safety pins and duct tape. <laughs> so okay. those are invaluable tools when you are traveling okay. for many things. So um, I, I actually used to go to wilderness medicine conferences, and there was an entire lecture on the use of safety pins and duct tape in the wilderness. So there are some, you know, things that you don't think, but 
you know, if something tears or your suitcase falls apart or you can always tape it or if your clothes tear or something. So, uh, and also uh, clothespins. I always take clothespins because those are handy to keep bags closed or to put a string up when you're washing your clothes. And so all those kinds of things or actually hang your, your dishes and your spoons up to air dry if you don't have something clean to dry them with. So there's a lot of tips. I'll also bring something to close the drain in the sink because if you want to wash your clothes or something, usually there's no uh, sink stopper in most sinks. So those are just sort of uh, practical things, you know. Always take a first aid kit that has bandage scissors and clean uh, dressings. And I also do recommend taking a triple antibiotic ointment with you, even if you're not... Uh, uh, big on antibiotics. There is a place for that in the tropics. If you get an infected wound in the tropics, you're in trouble. You're really in trouble. So, so what else is in your your safety kit? Is that or that pretty much it? No, I I really like to take um, homeopathics. You know because they're small, and so uh, one of the remedies I like a lot is cocculus. Cocculus is kind of a great remedy for jet lag. It's a remedy of disorientation and being kind of spaced out. I find it really great for jet lag. I always take Nux Vomica for food poisoning or uh, kind of being grumpy. And But really, if you think you ate some bad food or were exposed to some pesticides or something, you feel like you want to push your detox or you drank a little too much, you were partying, then you can take a little Nux Vomica. Uh, I like to take, uh, Gelsemium is a great remedy to take because not only is it a cold and flu remedy, but one of the keynotes of Gelsemium is that you're so tired you can't even lift your eyelid, you know. So if you get so exhausted, sometimes Gelsemium is a nice remedy. Uh, I also like to take Carbo Veg. That's just kind of a nice remedy for digestive upset with gas and bloating. That's nice to take. I always take peppermint tea bags and make a super strong cup of, of peppermint tea if I have gas. Um, so I like that. Sometimes I actually take a little Ziploc bag of cinnamon also for digestive stuff. If you're eating food, maybe you're in India and the food is you know more fried than you're used to and you need to help digest it a little better, you know, put a little cinnamon in it like that or you make your shake taste better or something like that if you don't have any fruit to mix with it. So I'll take that. Um, wound care. I'm big on taking wound care stuff. So uh, bandages that are in sealed envelopes, uh, little packets of betadine or alcohol to clean wounds with, all kinds of bandages. I'm a hiker, so I take all kinds of things for blisters on my feet. I also like to take tape to tape my feet. Uh, that's actually one of the best ways to not get blisters if you're walking a lot or hiking long distances. Um, I think, you know, if you have any orthopedic stuff, take a knee brace, take an ankle brace, you know. Definitely take some kind of a, a biodegradable uh, soap to clean your your clothes or your underwear with because you know you may not get to laundry for a long time and just having something clean is important to make sure it's biodegradable uh, always want to have something for digestion so peppermint is the simplest thing but you can take little containers of bitters also and uh, take those before your meals or some people take digestive enzymes but they're pretty temperature sensitive so they're not that great for travel so huh. stuff like that I take and I always so take did you have some, like a big travel story you want to share or, with with all of our listeners I'm, I'm sure there are many oh my goodness well have you ended up, ever ended up in a hospital in a foreign country um actually I once went to a hospital because I had a very high fever and I actually wanted to get a blood test to see what kind of infection I had and, of course, they couldn't identify it, but uh, I thought that was prudent because I'd had a very high fever for a long time. Whenever I go to the high Himalayas, I always get a respiratory infection. For some reason, there is something up there that I don't have resistance to. So mm -hmm. I always make sure that I take some herbs for uh, viral and bacterial infection 
So I'll take uh, maybe some andrographis and isatis and echinacea and golden seal and olive leaf. I'll take those kinds of things with me. And then I'll just, where I am there, I'll make really strong ginger tea and eat a lot of raw garlic. Uh, but, you know, there can be things like that. Um, I, um, I think that probably my greatest adventure was uh, one that I referred to earlier where we were trekking in the Himalayas in Bhutan for about three weeks and we went up and down over high passes and I was doing my high altitude cocktail and nutrients that I described to you and I actually hiked with the Sherpas because I was I had so much energy that I didn't have to hike with the other travelers <laughs> and so that was really cool but we went up and down and up and down so you have to really pace your energy you know and one of the interesting things about high altitude risks is that uh, younger people who are more fit tend to get more in trouble at high altitude than older people who are less fit. And the reason is that older people tend to pace themselves more and measure their energy, whereas young people will just kind of, you know, gun it, and, just, you know. And yeah, so, good, good. you know, what we're doing with every single speaker, we're, we're providing questions. Yeah. Everyone, so from your, you get a great topic here. Yeah. So we're going to provide 10 questions so people yeah, sure. get this yeah. in. Yeah. Like they, they've they got it in their yeah. memory banks. People are going to travel the world in a whole different way yeah. and in everyday life. Yes. Yeah by the wisdom that you're sharing. So that's important to, to, to say that um, if it's a good, true or false question. Yeah, so you have to pace yourself because people. if you have to hike at a high altitude or even like I used to do bushwalking through Africa and we might walk all day long, you have to pace yourself, make sure you have enough water and hydration. I'll tell you one great story before we finish. So we're walking in, I think we were in uh, Tanzania and we get up early in the morning before the heat of the day and we're walking down this dry riverbed and we stopped to have uh, something to drink and so we're sitting on the floor of the riverbed that was dry at the time and then we decided to walk up on top of the riverbank and we walked up there and there were three black maned lions right above where we were sitting and having our tea and we woke them up when we walked above and we were literally we were like you know 30 feet from these lions and there, there are three male black maned lions which are very rare kinds of lions so not only did we get to see them but uh there we were and so our guys just said okay back up really slowly you know? <laughs> and you know but i thought it was so cool i just love being up close to wild things you know but you have to know what to do. And so in, in situations like that, you absolutely have to travel with a guide because that's the only way to be kept safe. And of course, he had a gun in case we got into trouble. But I just thought that was one of the coolest things that ever happened to me. That's so cool. <laughs> now, when you're in Bhutan, you've been there yeah. many times. They actually have tigers in the wilds. They do, but Bhutan. tigers uh, avoid people, so you don't see them. However, I have to tell you, I was yeah. in Bhutan and so the, we were you know, traveling with a big group of people and two of the people actually came across we missed seeing a tiger i mean wow. we just went ahead we were ahead of them they actually saw which is a very rare thing yes, it's very rare another um when i was studying when i was in kenya i mean the wildlife there was just yes, amazing but you know the, the, yes. when it's always yes, great is yes, to see a leopard yes, they're yes. they're, they're yes, the hardest i've seen leopards in africa yeah you have hanging on the tree I you know like yeah see a leopard yeah. unfortunately yeah yeah you can see the cheetahs and the leopards kind of hang out in the daytime and they hang on the branches and they sleep there, you know? <laughs> As we wrap up here, my goodness, this has been so much fun and I've learned a lot too. It's good to hear these things. And yeah. just to mention this too, when you hear yeah. some of these products um, and some of these supplements and uh, just know that you just you, you take some really good notes. But also, the more you, you it, many of our speakers are saying some of the same things yeah. again and again, so you know that these are high priority when you when you prepare your healthy travelers kit. So you have as a gift, a free gift, this amazing thirteen delicious recipes for vibrant health. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I think one of the challenges traveling and certainly just in everyday life and a busy life is to eat really healthy. And so right. um, this is actually a collection of really great, amazing salad recipes. So it'll just give you lots of ideas of all the kinds of things you could put in a salad that you usually don't think about. And so we have like Asian and Mediterranean and 
Japanese and Vietnamese. We have all kinds of, of great salads with stuff you can buy, you know, anywhere and lovely dressings and things, but lots of antioxidants, lots of nutrients, lots of fun things to make. And you can take, I take salads on, you know, domestic flights. Of course. I do. I put it in a, in a glass container and, you know, it's worth it to me. Yeah. And then I can use the glass container for other purposes. That's right. It's kind of nice when you get a, you know, something can also be a water bottle too. Exactly. You, you can exactly. actually put certain types of food in. Um, so that's a, that's a, a good choice. So you also have, which, shake it up. Talk about shake it up. Well, and how people can take healthy shakes on the road. So, you know, one of my strategies, both at home, but especially traveling, I take smoothie and shake ingredients with me. Right. And I just mix it all up together in a Ziploc bag. And then I just scoop it out and I put it in my bottle. And if I want to have something on a long plane flight, as I mentioned, I take a shaker bottle so I can make it on the plane because you can't take liquids, right? So um, this is about 60 recipes of really wow. great shakes. So, you know, you can have some variety and some fun with it too, but be getting really high density of nutrients really easily and packable, right? Really packable. Awesome. And I see you're offering this to our community for a discounted rate. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So shakes and salads, I mean, you certainly can uh, use these great recipes and um, I, I'm a big, also I, a big fan of shakes. It just, it just, if you know you're going to get into, a, you know, one of your destinations in the middle of the night right, or at right. ten o'clock right. at night, and you just want something, because right. I find that if I'm hungry, I don't sleep because my 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 um, right. blood your sugars all over the place. Up. My cortisol right. is right. elevated too, yeah. so just having some protein can really ground yeah. me or some yeah. good fat. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even just traveling locally, like I travel to lecture a lot, and I'll end up in a hotel that I didn't choose. That has nothing to eat on the menu for me. So at least I have my right. shake, you know. Shake it up. I like the name <laughs> of that product, too. So any final comments that you want to leave with our listeners? Because, I, I mean, you obviously have traveled for lots of years. You, yeah. You, you, since yeah. you practice, you treat a lot of patients, too, that travel a lot. Well, I have to say that I think traveling probably has transformed me more than almost anything else in my life. Absolutely. You know, traveling to see all the ways that there is to do a human life and takes us out of our arrogance and our ethnocentrism and really, I think, has has made me a much more open-hearted and tolerant and appreciative person. And that's really the gift of travel, I think. And so in order to have that kind of experience, you really have to be willing to be uncomfortable sometimes and and, <laughs> so and get out of your comfort zone, whether that's the kind of toilet paper you like or where you want to sleep or, you know, eat what you want to eat, is to just be open because then you'll have an extraordinary experience. And the people who don't enjoy traveling wish it was like home, you know? And, and that's not why you travel. You don't travel so it's like home. You travel to go to be a bigger person. And so if you do that, I think you can have an extraordinary experience. Beautifully said. Yeah. You travel to be a bigger person. Yeah. That's so yeah. true. This is, yeah. um, it's like a passion. I love seeing the yeah. world. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's certainly that unity and diversity message. I love that you shared that. But I, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's it's changed me more than just about anything. Is, is yes. going to a lot of these yes. beautiful places, yes. and we could do some traveling together. We can leave on that note. We're going to make a date. <laughs> I'm going to some groovy place. Yeah. I think you said you're going to India. I'm not sure that's on my list. I've already been. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Which it's always different. North and southern India, yeah. India yeah. is like two different countries, right? It's like oh, the United it's very States, diverse. And North yeah. and South. Yeah. Yeah. I'm heading this summer. I'm heading to with my children that are 13 and 15. We are going to Iceland. I've never oh, been there. Wow. Then we're going to go to Copenhagen, uh -huh. and then we're going to go to Norway. So that's yeah. kind of my treat. Yeah. The end of the summit, yeah. when the summit goes yeah. for all of you, yeah. if you happen to live, you're watching this, and um, you know that's where I'm going to be this summer. You know, you gotta you gotta email me, <laughs> and I will um, hope to meet you on yeah. the road. That would yeah. be really cool. Yeah. So thanks again, Nalini. This was invaluable. Gosh, great, great information. I appreciate you so much as a dear friend, a colleague, and a world traveler friend of mine, too. So take care. Thanks. Love you, Robin. Love you, too.